Okay. Okay, so are there any questions? So we're covering this Benabu and Tirol paper. Um, uh, there are two papers, 2003 and 2006. Both of them are trying to give some theoretical underpinnings why monetary incentives may sometimes backfire. Right? They may produce uh, the uh, opposite kind of uh, effect than it is intended. Uh, so we saw that uh, in the previous lecture, uh, essentially um, there's a model with intrinsic motivation and in that case, the bonus is, is actually, the offer of a bonus is a signal of bad news. It, it uh, conveys the information that the agent is of lower ability or has lower chance of success. Uh, now, in the analysis that we did, we just uh, assumed away flat wages. We, get flat wages out of the picture. Um, so what we're going to do today in the first to, to begin with is uh, take that Benabutero model and allow for both uh, performance-based pay bonuses as well as flat wages. So flat wages are independent of performance, whether the agent succeeds or not, uh, that uh, wage is, is uh, paid out uh, regardless, and uh, a bonus is only paid when the agent succeeds. So let's consider the full-fledged contractual uh, possibility and see what happens. So we'll allow for contracts of the form A, B, where A is the unconditional flat wage. Okay, it's a, it's a payment which is promised to the agent regardless of his performance. And B is the conditional payment, which is, you may call it a bonus. Uh, it is paid uh, only when the agent succeeds. And remember the model, I, I won't rehash it, but the uh, significant features of the model, which makes it different from a standard moral hazard model. One is that the agent has some intrinsic motivation. So even if no payments are made to the agent, the agent obtains a payoff V whenever the agent succeeds. Uh, this V is just not enough, at least for the low ability types. So they have to be uh, reinforced with some monetary rewards. Uh, but, but V is strictly positive. In traditional moral hazard models, V is zero. And the other important thing is that uh, the agent's ability or the prospect of success, that is, known to the principal, not to the agent. So this makes this framework what is called an informed principal framework. Uh, so these are the two novel features of the model that we are studying. Okay. Now, when we allow for both kinds of payments, flat wages as well as bonuses, here's the claim. We can construct a perfect Bayesian equilibrium in which uh, there is a fully separating equilibrium. Uh, in, when we only allowed for bonuses, there was some randomization, if you remember. Uh, it was a semi-separating equilibrium. Uh, but once you allow both kinds of payments, you can create a clear separation. Uh, and the equilibrium is of the following kind. Uh, if the agent is low ability, then AL is zero, no flat wages paid out. Uh, the only kind of payment is the bonus. So BL equal to B star. Remember what B star is? B star is equal to this amount. It's the minimum bonus, which will make the low ability uh, type uh, work hard, right? Put in effort equal to one. So that's the minimum bonus. Uh, 
So in this separating equilibrium, the low type will not get a flat wage. You will get a bonus, which is equal to the uh, lowest bonus that will extract a high level of effort. The high type will not be paid any bonus at all. The high type will be paid a flat wage, okay, which is equal to this amount. And both types will choose effort level one. So even when uh, the, the, a flat wage is paid, the agent actually chooses to work hard. When the agent is offered a bonus, the agent learns that he's a low type. This is a separating equilibrium. So that's bad news, that's demotivating. However, the bonus works in the usual way. The bonus is a monetary incentive for the agent to work hard. For the high type, um, there's no monetary stake to work hard, but the flat wage is a signal that the type is high, that the agent is high ability and has a high chance of success if she works hard. And that is what induces high level of effort. So as you know, in, in your traditional, usual moral hazard theory, uh, flat wages are supposed to do nothing as far as incentives are concerned, right? They are, they are uh, useless to provide incentives. Here we see a dramatic difference. Uh, high agents, when they're offered a fixed salary, uh, it encourages them to work hard by conveying to them positive information, useful information that your, your ability is high. And since they have some intrinsic motivation, it, it uh, encourages them to go ahead and uh, put in a high level of effort. So let's check. Okay. So, this, yes. So I'll, I'll just run through the proof why why this is a, an equilibrium. Yes, go ahead. So how did we get that magnitude of AH uh, as C minus theta LV? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, first of all, let me show you that this claim is true. Okay, then we can talk about how, how it's derived. Uh, so let me show you that given these flat wages and bonuses, uh, this equilibrium works. Um, so uh, basically what needs to be satisfied are two incentive constraints. When the actual type is high, theta is theta H, it must be in the principal's interest to offer the flat wage contract. And this should be theta L really. Uh, so when the, the type is low, it should be in the principal's interest to offer the bonus contract, not the flat wage contract. So these two incentive constraints give, will give us two inequalities, okay? Um, so for the, for the high type, this is the incentive constraint. This is saying that, uh, you know, uh, so this is written in general, right? For general values of AH, BH, and so on. Uh, so if the principal offers the contract, he's supposed to offer the high type, this is his expected payoff, right? Uh, the flat wage has to be paid no matter what, so that's subtracted. The bonus is only paid when there is success, which is with probability theta h. So, so this is the overall payoff of the principal. Remember, w is the principal's gain when the project succeeds. Uh, so this is greater than this amount. <clears throat> if the principal offers the, the other contract, which is supposed to go to the low type, then this is the principal's expected payoff. So you rearrange this inequality and you get this inequality. This, this difference between the flat wages for the two types should be less than or equal to this probability weighted bonus difference. 
Now, when the type is actually low, we get a similar incentive constraint, which simplifies to this inequality, okay? Now, in the claimed equilibrium, are these two inequalities satisfied? That can easily be checked by inserting the values, okay? So once you insert the values, these inequalities uh, reduce to, to what we have in this last line over here. And uh, both parts of these inequalities is true. Um, now, in response to the question from a few minutes back, uh, how did we get this expression? Okay, this expression, this value of AH is obtained by um, making one of these two incentive constraints binding. I think the first one. Um, yes. So make treating this as, as an equality. Okay. That's how you get exactly that expression. In other words, uh, this AH, this particular value, is the minimum flat wage that will uh, do the job of signaling high quality. Okay, you can if you if you offer a wage which is greater than this, then that also credibly signals that, that the type is high. Um, but uh, but this is the lowest that will do the job. What is now? Uh, so let's. Review the intuition. What is the intuition? Why? Why does? Uh, why does a flat wage uh, signal high productivity and uh, motivate high level of effort? What is going on exactly? Uh, now, the principle has two choices, right? Try to motivate the worker through offering a bonus or offering a flat wage. Um, now, a flat wage is a flat wage, okay? So if a flat wage is offered, that's a cost which is independent of whether the agent is actually high ability or low ability, all right? It's a flat wage, it has to be paid no matter what, whether the agent succeeds or not. So that part is constant. Now, if the principal offers a bonus, then what is the expected cost? The expected cost is the probability of success times the bonus. The bonus only has to be paid when the project succeeds. For high ability agents, the probability of success is higher, so they succeed more often. So trying to motivate them through bonuses is more costly actually to the principal. Right, bonuses are the costlier way of, of extracting high effort when the agent is high ability. And that is what gives rise to this kind of separating equilibrium, right? Um, when the agent is low ability, the fin principal finds it more economical to motivate the agent with a bonus. But when the agent is high ability, that flips around, right? Now it's more economical to, to uh, to extract uh, high effort through flat wages. And this is the main reason why we can create a separating equilibrium like that. And as a result, at the end of the day, flat wages play an important role. They signal to the agent that ability is high uh, and uh, so, so motivates the agent that way. So going back to the kind of, you know, this, this story I was saying as an illustration about this uh, cricket coaching camp and uh, this coach is trying to, trying to get the best out of these young people who have uh, uh, come there to, to become cricketers. Uh, so for the really talented uh, members of this cricket academy, the ones who are the next Virat Kohli in the making, 
what the court will want to do is give them a prize even before they have succeeded, even before they have uh, proved their mark, right? That unconditional prize or upfront prize will signal that you're the next Kohli. Whereas for the less talented, mediocre guys, what the coach will do is the coach will give a conditional prize. The coach will say, okay, if you make it to the national team, then I'll buy you this fancy bike. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the form that it takes. Uh, when you allow both kinds of uh, payments, flat wages as well as uh, bonuses, you can see that information is fully revealed and efficiency is restored. Now, now we don't have the inefficiency that was arising when, um, when only bonuses were, were allowed. Um, now, the bonus has similar properties as, as before, right? So let's review that. The bonus signals bad news. For those agents who receive bonus, uh, they'll work hard while they are on the bonus, but they learn something negative about themselves, that they are not the best type. Their probability of success is, is not that high. So it encourages effort, the bonus. <coughs> uh, if information were held constant. Uh, now, the bonus may be negatively correlated with productivity or performance. So in this equilibrium construction, both of them work hard, right? It's the low ability types which receive bonus-based contracts. And they succeed less often. They succeed with probability theta L, whereas the ones which get flat wages, they succeed more often theta H. So, so if you had a data generated by this model, then you will find a negative correlation between um, bonuses and performance. But that's entirely because of the selection effect. Bonuses are offered precisely to the guys who are uh, not that productive or whose success is not that likely. The important thing which I emphasized before, let me underscore that once more before I move on, is that since bonuses signal bad news, their short-term and their long-term effects may be very different. Okay. So today the principal offers a bonus, the agent uh, learns that is a low type, but because of the bonus, he's, he's working hard. Tomorrow, the bonus is withdrawn. Maybe there's a different principle comes along, or uh, you know, there's a budget crunch, so no money can be offered anymore. Think of many different things. Um, once the bonus is withdrawn, there's a negative effect on productivity and performance because after the withdrawal of the bonus, what still sticks is the agent's knowledge that is low type. And because of that, uh, it depresses effort and so on. Okay, once again, you can relate it to, uh, you know, that daycare experiment uh, that we talked about. One of the mysteries there was, even after the penalties were withdrawn, um, the, rate of late coming did not go back to old levels. And this model illustrates why that might happen because the contract itself reveals some information which may have a long-term effect. Okay, any questions? No questions? So, yes. Uh, what does the information being held constant mean? So, <clears throat> the, 
the the uh, suppose the low type knows that he's a low type right from the start suppose right then the bonus is actually has a positive effect on, on effort and productivity right okay so that's what i mean by information being held constant in reality in actuality what is going on is that when a bonus is offered in this model uh two things happen one is the agent learns something about himself and what he learns is is negative news actually he learns that his low ability so information is not held constant some information is is revealed uh, through the contractual form but the second aspect of the bonus is that it encourages work effort in the standard way right it's a performance based pay so it encourages performance to that degree yes so as long as in the in the equilibrium that we have constructed as long as uh, the bonus is in place its negative effect is overcome by the positive standard incentive effect yes but once the bonus is taken away for some reason the only thing which remains is is that uh, is that information effect that, that the agent has learned that is low ability uh, that uh, becomes the negative force uh, so if the principal is taking away the bonus in the next period then can't it signal that the that the player the agent is better than uh, what or how he was in the first period maybe he has improved over time well if the principal at some point uh, reveals that information by you know uh, by uh, offering the bonus then how can that be changed you know that information has already been revealed yes one way to think about it is that uh, i think in the paper they talk about the one one sort of way of thinking is that maybe there's a succession of principles right dealing with the same agent so the first period principle only has a short term interest in it and so it plays this separating equilibrium and uh, uh, you know the low ability agent gets the bonus and learns the negative news about uh, himself and then the first period principle goes away and some new principle comes along that new principle will be saddled with this negative information effect that the agent has learned his low ability okay now he can still counter it by offering a bonus again uh, but but that effect is permanently there and if some future principal finds it in, infeasible to offer the bonus for whatever financial reasons then uh, effort and incentives etc will will drop okay so Okay. No questions. All right. So let me move on to the other Benabu Tirol paper. But before that, let us discuss some uh, experiments and some uh, some some observations, which uh, will motivate that paper. Uh, some of this I, I talked about in your micro course, I think. So I'll, I'll go over it quickly. Um, I talked about the blood donation example in the micro course, didn't I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the main thing is that, you know, uh, there was this very interesting debate and controversy in the 1970s about uh, the debate was about the comparison of the uh, British system, which was purely voluntary, 
paying for blood was, was illegal in Britain. Uh, people could give blood, but uh, only on a voluntary basis. Whereas the American system was mixed, uh, hospitals could pay people to get blood for their blood banks. Uh, but at the same time, you know, people could, could give it for free. And uh, the British sociologist Richard Titmus wrote a book where he criticized the American system and said that it leads to less availability of blood, poor quality blood, and a whole host of problems. So he praised the purely voluntary British system. And this triggered a uh, public debate where uh, some of the people who, who uh, criticized Titmus's view were stalwart economists like uh, Kenneth Arrow and Robert Solo. And Arrow and Solo made two simple points. One is that uh, in terms of evidence, in terms of empirics, you know, Britain and America are different in so many ways. So just saying that, okay, I mean, the, any difference you see in outcomes cannot be attributed just to the uh, different systems, right? These are very different societies which, which differ on many, many different dimensions. Uh, so it could be because of any of those other dimensions. But more importantly, from a theoretical perspective, what they said is that uh, this makes no sense because supply curves are supposed to be upward sloping. Uh, purely voluntary system means the price is zero. Yes, a praise, uh, 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 paid system means the price is positive. So why should the supply curve be back, you know, have the wrong slope? Uh, so there may be generous people who uh, will give blood even at a zero price, even when they're not compensated. Those people should continue to give blood when payments are allowed. Some less selfless people, in addition, will probably step forward and, and give blood. So the overall collection should go up, not down. So, um, so those are the uh, things. One of the people who jumped into the fray in this in this sort of debate, and it was a very healthy debate, both sides argued very respectfully. Uh, um, so one of the people who jumped in and, and defended Richard Titmus, the sociologist, was Peter Singer, who was a philosopher, a very well-known philosopher. Um, and Singer said, uh, no, payments may crowd out voluntary donations. And one of the arguments which Singer made, which is not the argument that we'll study in the model, but something somewhat different, but let let me still still mention it. Uh, Singer, in his article, um, looks at. Uh, by the way, all of these are there in the course website, so you have links to some of these extra readings, including articles by Solo, Arrow, and Singer, and so on. Uh, so so uh, you can uh, follow up those, and, and they make for interesting reading. Um, so Singer, in his article, mentions <coughs> an interview with a woman in Britain who had come into a hospital and donated blood. And when she was leaving, a reporter interviewed her and asked her, why did you donate blood? What made you come in and, and do this uh, generous act for society? And this is what she said. To try and repay in some small way, some unknown person whose blood helped me recover from two operations and enabled me to be with my family. So, a few months back, she herself was seriously ill and she needed blood, okay, for some operation. 
And uh, she got the blood and, and got well. And then she felt gratitude. Okay, that blood she knew came from a good Samaritan, somebody who, who just did it out of the goodness of her heart and not for any return. And so she felt a moral obligation that when, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, charitable act, she has to pay it back uh, so that when she got better, she went back and gave blood herself. So Singer's argument is that, um, that uh, in a paid system, this obligation won't be there, right? You go to a hospital, you pay for everything, including the blood you receive, and you know that the one person who supplied the blood also got payment for it. So you feel no particular moral urge later to donate blood yourself, right? Uh, you, you think that, well, I, uh, yes, it benefited me, but I, I paid for it, okay? Um, so to the extent people have these sentiments of reciprocity, a paid system will destroy it. It's, it can only thrive under a voluntary system. Um, okay, uh, but moving on, what, uh, what we'll study is a different reason why, uh, you know, under, under a paid system, uh, blood donation may actually fall. Now, in reality, what happens? Okay, let's, let's uh, stick with the empirical part a little bit more before we get to the theory. Uh, is it really true that we can see a perverse effect uh, in terms of blood donation when, when prices are put on the table? So, you know, in the 70s, that question was, you know, it was a very much an open-ended question. Um, but under more controlled experimental situations, like this is one paper which shows that what Richard Titmus was talking about does have some merit or has some empirical relevance, it seems. Uh, so uh, this, this is a randomized control trial in a Swedish hospital. Uh, some black camp was opened on campus and uh, subjects were divided into three groups. All of them were asked whether they would like to donate blood. The first group had no rewards, right? The second group would be paid $7. The third group uh, wouldn't be paid into their pockets, but they, would, they could specify a charity and the $7 will go to that charity. Okay, so standard, economic theory, you know, this, this idea that supply curves should be positively sloped, that leads us to expect that the, uh, the response rate, the positive response rate should be lowest for group one, followed by group three, and it should be highest for group two. That's what our expectations are. Um, now, you have seen this, you know, in, in uh, earlier when I was in the first in my group, uh, lectures. Once again, um, there is a surprising dip in the second treatment, right, from 50% to 30%. And this is the most pronounced uh, among women. Uh, but let's not focus so much on the gender side of it. Uh, this pattern itself is, is on the face of it at least, perplexing. Uh, so when money is, is offered, uh, there's a substantial reduction in blood donation. So we need to understand that. Um, there's another slide which shows that, you know, among the three groups of students, um, um, you know, you, 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 you see the sort of uh, surprising EU pattern, uh, 
everywhere. Yes. Uh, among all three uh, branches, but uh, for any particular treatment, uh, the economic students are not very, they are the least generous, it seems. And so, um, anyway. Uh, I had a small question. Yes. So uh, uh, we could ascribe the previous result to uh, things like maybe uh, uh, altruism or oh, sorry, uh, 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 a want for you know demonstrating altruism rather than altruism in itself. Uh, but how do we uh, ascribe the second results of you know the heterogeneity with respect to the profession and the results? <laughs> There are two views on this, right? I mean, there are some studies where economic students have been contrasted with uh, other disciplines, students from other disciplines, like how, how they play the prisoner's dilemma, for example. Um, Robert Frank of Cornell, uh, he ran some experiments in his labs on econ versus non-econ students, and he claims econ students are more mercenary, right? In prisoner's dilemma, they, they defect more often. Whereas uh, uh, non-econ students uh, cooperate more op often, so, so one view is that uh, you guys are all nice people who come to study economics. We turn you into terrible, selfish maximizers, right? And the other view is that economics attracts people who are who are uh, uh, not so generous. So so let me keep it open-ended, we don't know. Uh, I, I'm being partly tongue-in-cheek. I don't think there's a huge volume of evidence that e economic students are, are substantially different from others. Uh, one or two experiments, it has come out that way. Uh, let's let not make a big deal out of it. Uh, surely the, you know, I think you guys are studying economics at an advanced level. Uh, the the main lessons of the kind of economics you're studying is not that you shouldn't help other people, you shouldn't donate to charity, you shouldn't give blood. There's no such lesson actually. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I hope that should be clear to you, right? You're um, as as a rational agent. Ra being a rational agent doesn't mean you have to be selfish and money-minded, uh, right? Uh, you're, you, you can very well have other goals beyond your own material goals. Uh, a rational agent just means somebody who, who is, um, you know, uh, able to pursue his or her goals to the maximum possible extent. Now, his or her goals can include various uh, social uh, objectives and, and the interests of others. Yeah. Um, so to say that you know the kind of textbook economics preaches selfishness is is a caricature of textbook economics. I, I hope that is clear to all of you guys, right? Yes, sir. Sir, also your take was a little hilarious. <laughs> Which one? Uh, sir, on uh, the joke about the the economic students being mercenaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, let's try, let's just try to be better. Let's take a pledge that let's match those other guys in terms of generosity and, and, and you know, uh, acting in the interest of society. Okay, uh, now let me show you another uh, I mean, here are some quotations which are relevant. Let, let me not dwell on them. You can, you can read them and see the relevance uh, later. Um, here's a very interesting paper by William Harbaugh. Uh, what he looked at is donations to some law schools. So there's this American law school, which brings out its annual glossy, kind of volume for its alumnus and so on. And, uh, you know, 
various alumni donate to the law school. And uh, these American universities are very good at this, right? They, they, uh, the people who have graduated and gone on to be very rich or in powerful positions, they are always, uh, you know, sweet talking them and asking them to donate and they raise a lot of funds that way, right? So there's this whole gravy trail which they tap into. Um, so what this law school used to do is uh, earlier, they used to publish the names of all the donors and they would publish their exact donation amount against each person's name that would be listed. But then things got larger, you know, the list of donors grew. So they uh, moved to a system where they place the donors in categories, okay? So they created ranges. So for example, 100 to 249, and 250 to 499, 500 to 999. So these are sort of ranges. And this is published names against each of these blocks, right? So, so this range of donations, they said, okay, X, Y, and Z. This range of donations, A, B, and C. Um, now, of course, the data of actual individual donations was still there with the law school. They just didn't publish it. And what Harbaugh did is he collected the data of individual donations from, from the school. And what he studied was the impact of this rule change, how the information was revealed to the public, whether that changed behavior, donation behavior. And he found a very interesting pattern, okay? Um, let me show you the picture. At certain levels, donations went down, but donations went up and sometimes significantly went up at certain other levels, right? So for example, $1,000 donations saw a huge spike. Similarly, $250 donations, $500 donations, yes. So what explains this pattern? Um, what explains it is people were very conscious about which block they were placed in, okay? In the earlier system, how much you donated was exactly reported, right? So, okay, fine, you donate what you can. And in the new system, if you were donating, for example, you know, two, uh, $240, then you, it's tempting for you to increase that a little bit more and cross into 250 so that you jump into that higher category, right? Either you do that, or you lower your donation all the way to the lower value, you know, the, the hundred, uh, because uh, between hundred and two forty, no distinction is is being made as far as the public information is concerned, right? So under the new system, what you would expect is a lot of clustering towards the lower end of these these ranges, right? People would just about cross over into a category and then not increase the donations too much. And that is exactly what you observe, okay? In a world where donors are not image conscious, they were just, you know, weighing their own needs versus the needs of the law school or some other entity, in a pure altruism model, in other words, uh, you, you don't expect to see this. So that suggests that the people who are donating also care about how they look, how they come across. So that takes us to the Bene Tirol 2006 paper, which models this. Uh, here's the overview conceptually. People have three reasons to engage in pro-social behavior, right? Sort of helping others, devoting their own 
time, money, energy to, to help others or to promote social causes, interests of others. One reason is rewards or punishments. And this is the standard thing, extrinsic motivation. Yes. Um, I don't drive badly because I fear that uh, you know, if I break traffic rules, I'll have to pay huge fines. And that's extrinsic motivation. Um, the second reason is caring about others, and that's intrinsic motivation. Okay, we do care about others. We don't want to just you know maximize our own narrow material interest. Uh, we want to help out uh, the poor, the needy and so on, the sick. Uh, but a third reason is caring about image. Okay, so we have extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation, and reputational motivation. What do other people think about us? And all of these three are working in tandem. Okay. So now if rewards or punishments are increased, if you try to strengthen the extrinsic motivation part, paying for blood donation, increasing traffic fines, and so on, uh, putting a penalty on, on people who uh, don't put their garbage in the right places, and so on, yeah. So increasing the rewards and punishments has, has two effects. Of course, it has a direct effect, right? I mean, it will strengthen the extrinsic motivation part. Okay, so other things equal, setter is paribus, right? it will have a standard effect. However, there's an indirect effect. It may reduce the reputational motivation uh, because more bad types engage in uh, pro-social behavior. Yeah. Uh, so this is what may lead to crowding out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you may have a situation where increase in rewards and punishments strengthens extrinsic motivation, but it weakens reputational motivation to such an extent that the overall effect goes in the wrong direction. That's the broad idea. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of blood donation, to, to go back to that example, uh, in a purely voluntary system, anybody who gives blood is just doing a generous act, right? There's no other reason to, uh, to donate blood. But in a paid system, that message gets substantially weakened. Uh, if I donate blood, it could be because I'm generous and want to help others, but it could also be because I'm just a cheapskate that I, you know, I, I, I'm greedy. I just want to grab the seven dollars, uh, and that may lead some people to to withdraw from the generous act. Um, so we we'll look at the model. I'll, I'll present a highly simplified version. I mean, the actual paper has a you know more general model. I'll, I'll simplify it, uh, and there are two main points which will emerge. Okay, so let me set them out or underline them at the beginning. The first point we'll see, and the most important one, is that rewards punishments may crowd out pro-social behavior. So that's a strong warning to us that in some situations, in certain kinds of uh, problems, um, we should be careful about bringing in monetary incentives. So that's one point. And the other point is multiple equilibria. Okay, so in the model, you'll see that uh, for the same parameters, we can have an equilibrium where lots of people uh, act pro-socially, generously, and so on. But there can be another equilibrium where that doesn't happen. So this last point is also saying that uh, when there's a strong signaling component, um, you know, social norms and conventions are very important. Uh, uh, a particular society can take one path, 
another society which is very similar could take a completely different path. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll get to the model very quickly. Are there any questions? Okay, here's the model. Uh, so there are two actions, zero and one. Action one is the pro-social action, right? Donating blood, um, putting your garbage in the right place instead of throwing it in the street, uh, driving carefully, what have you. So the action one, the pro-social action, carries an individual cost of C and has a reward of Y, right? Y is the extrinsic motivation part. Um, Now, the agent gets intrinsic payoff V from choosing the pro-social action, right? V is positive. So this again, there's this intrinsic motivation assumption. This is saying that people do care about uh, trying to, trying to uh, promote the interests of others. They're not entirely selfish. Now, we'll assume that this V is not the same for everyone. Right. Some people have low V, they are closer to the selfish end of the spectrum. Some people have high V, they're highly generous people. Okay. So in the population, V follows a distribution of captured by the distribution function F. Okay. However, each person's V is only known to themselves. Okay. It's private information. That's what makes it interesting. That what, that's what brings in the signaling aspect that what we do reveals something about ourselves that others didn't know before. Okay, so if the agent chooses action zero, which is the selfish action, the non-pro-social action, then the agent's payoff is zero. And if the agent acts pro-socially, then this is the net payoff of the agent. V is the intrinsic motivation, right? I get V just for its own sake. It's the warm glow of acting in the interest of society. Then there's the price, whatever the price is on offer. Y, extrinsic motivation part. Minus C, C is the cost of taking this action. And this last term is the critical one, which is absolutely central to this story. Mu times R, mu is a parameter. What is R? R is the reputational gain from choosing the pro-social action. So others can see your action, they cannot see your V and therefore how generous you are, what your type is, they can't see that. They'll draw inferences about your V by observing what you have done, whether you've chosen action zero or action one. Now, R is the reputational gain. If you choose action zero, action one instead of zero, um, you get, get some reputational gain. I'll explain exactly what that is. Um, it is this. Um, we'll see that in equilibrium, there's a threshold, okay? there will be a threshold. An agent whose V is above some cutoff value will act pro-socially, choose A equal to one. And those below, the ones who are not so generous, uh, they'll choose action zero, okay? So if others observe that I acted pro-socially, then they'll update their beliefs about my possible V. Okay, they'll know that, oh, his V is above V bar. So they'll calculate an expectation of V, conditional on the fact that I'm above the threshold. That's why I, I chose the pro-social action. On the other hand, if I choose action zero, don't act pro-socially, they'll immediately know that my, uh, that my V, my generosity, the strength of my generosity 
is below the cutoff. So they'll do another conditional expectation based on that information. And the gap between these, these two is what we are calling R, the reputational gain when you act pro-socially. And mu is a parameter which captures how much you care about this reputational gain, right? It's a preference parameter. So this is the overall payoff for the agent. Is that clear to everyone? And so? Yes. Um, so what is the difference between V and Y? Y is a monetary payment or reward. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you think of one as donating blood and zero as not donating blood, then why is that $7 which they are paying? Yes, okay. Okay, now let's uh, play around with this a little bit. So what we really need to find out, uh, what we need, really need to pin down is this cutoff V bar, right? This is endogenous. This is endogenous. So to find an equilibrium, we have to essentially find a value of V bar. So, uh, So at the cutoff, so those with V strictly greater than V bar would strictly prefer action one. Those with V strictly lower than V bar would strictly prefer action zero. So that means by continuity that at V equal to V bar, the agents who, who, whose generosity is exactly that cutoff, they should be indifferent between the two actions, right? So we'll exploit that indifference property to pin down our equilibrium as usual. So this is the indifference property, right? For the V bar types, for the threshold types, uh, this minus C, sorry. Uh, so let's define the phi function as this thing, right? Uh, so whenever this thing is equal to C, they're indifferent between the two actions, right? So this is our indifference condition. Okay. Now, let's take the uniform distribution. Let's say V is uniformly distributed on zero one. Let's try to solve for the equilibrium in this case. Okay. Um, First of all, let's construct the reputation function. Okay, for any cutoff, um, this is the reputation gain. If you fix an arbitrary cutoff, this is the reputation gain, right? Because uh, when action one is chosen, that means the agent's V is above the cutoff. Uh, so, so it's between V bar and one, okay? So this is the conditional density function. This is uniform distribution, so, so it's pretty simple. And we are integrating from V bar to one. So we are taking the expectation of, this, this is basically implementing this, you know, this conditional expectation for the special case of uniform distribution, right? So you calculate this difference and it turns out to be a constant actually. It is independent of V bar. It is exactly half. Uh, it's not very difficult to see, right? Uh, well, how we get this term? Uniform distribution term, sir? How we get the uniform distribution term? Let me, let me use a picture. Should be much clearer that way. Uh, zero one. Okay. 
Now, assume some arbitrary cutoff. So people above this cutoff choose action one, they act pro-socially. People below this cutoff choose action zero, they act selfishly. Suppose all observers think that this is, this is the way people behave. So if we observe somebody acting pro-socially, that means their V must be in this range. So what is the expected, expected value of their V? Well, the midpoint, which is one plus V bar by two. On the other hand, if we see somebody acting selfishly, action zero, then we immediately know that their V must be between zero and V bar. So you calculate the expectation. That's the midpoint for the uniform distribution, V bar by two. And now if you take the difference between these two conditional expectations, you're left with half. Okay. So that's how we got, got that number. So this reputational gain, when you switch to the pro-social action is, oh. is um, always half. So what is the equilibrium condition? Equilibrium condition is this you know, this phi function, which is essentially all the, all the uh, benefits of acting pro-socially, right? For the marginal type, the last type which uh, chooses pro-social action and is therefore indifferent between acting pro-socially or not. For that type, these, these are all the benefits. This is the intrinsic motivation, V bar. Uh, mu times the reputational gain, which is half, so that's the reputational payoff. And this is the extrinsic motivation, the reward for acting that way. So this is the overall benefit that should equal the cost. And that's our equilibrium condition. This is our indifference. This is what guarantees that this marginal type V bar is indifferent between the pro-social action and the other action. Um, now, let's plot this on a picture um, here's the picture okay um, this should really be v bar i couldn't get the bar on the on the labeling so in this picture we are taking this threshold value and varying it allowing it to be to take up different values out uh, so for every possible value of V bar, um, this phi function, is, it ha so, so basically the phi function has a slope of one, right? And an intercept of mu by two plus y. So this is mu by two plus y, and then it has a slope of one. And wherever it cuts the cost line, that's where our, uh, equilibrium is. So V star is the equilibrium value of V bar. Okay. That's the magical value of the threshold that will make this whole thing, whole construction work as an equilibrium. So the thing to see here is that there's a unique equilibrium. Okay. Um, so for the uniform distribution, we get a unique equilibrium. So the two main results that we are after, one is the multiplicity. The multiplicity thing doesn't work for uniform distribution. And you can make the heuristic argument that, you know, this, this equilibrium is stable. So if the threshold for some reason starts above V star, pretty soon it'll, approach V star. Why is that? Well, if it's above V star, then the marginal type 
right? This phi is the benefit function, remember? C is the cost of acting pro-socially. So if the threshold started being above V star, then even the marginal type, the last type, which is supposed to act pro-socially, for them, the benefit is strictly more on the cost. So they strictly prefer acting pro-socially. So some of the types who have a lower V will also want to act pro-socially, okay, by continuity. And so if the threshold starts above V star, it will keep falling, right? More people will enter the pro-social club. And so it'll approach V star from above. And by the same token, it will approach V star from below. So there's a unique equilibrium and it's stable. Okay. So we are not getting multiplicity. Are we getting the other effect we are seeking here? What is the other effect? The other effect says that uh, sometimes there can be crowding out, meaning you increase Y the extrinsic motivation part, the, the monetary reward. If we increase Y, the set of people acting pro-socially goes down rather than up. That is when the effect is perverse. You're offering more money, but fewer people are acting pro-socially as a result. Does that effect arise here? Well, the answer is no. If you increase Y, that means this benefit curve, remember its equation, this thing, right? So Y appears on the intercept, it's part of the in intercept term. So if we increase Y, this whole benefit curve moves up. So the new equilibrium cutoff is to, further to the left. And remember the, set of people acting pro-socially are all the people who are above the cutoff, right? So that set has actually increased. So with this uniform distribution version, at least, uh, increasing monetary rewards will lead to more pro-social behavior, not less. So that's standard. Okay, now that's disappointing but that's telling you things can go in different directions. Let's look at another distribution. Instead of uniform, we'll take a convex distribution where the, the, the distribution function is V squared. So the density function is two. Okay. Let's see what happens with this one. Same method of analysis, do we get somewhat different results. Well, first thing to construct is the reputational gain function, right? This R of V function. That's again, this difference, okay? When pro-social action is observed, we know the type is between V bar and one. So this is the conditional expectation of V in that case. When the action choice is observed to be zero, the condition, we know that V is below V bar, between zero and V bar. This is the conditional expectation in that case. Calculate the difference. This is what we get. Now it's no longer constant. For uniform distribution, it was constant. Here it's not constant. In fact, this is decreasing in V bar. Okay. Now, let's construct the equilibrium condition. Again, for the marginal type, phi is the benefit. V bar, intrinsic motivation. This is the um, reputational gain based on this calculation we just did. And this is the external motivation, extrinsic. So all of that has to equal C for the threshold type, the guy who's just sitting at the threshold between the two actions. Okay. Um, now, um, you can take the derivative of this, you get this expression. So if mu is high enough, people care enough about reputation, this derivative will be negative. You can 
just do the maths of that. So let's see what that means. So the phi function is downward sloping. Okay. And there's one intersection over here. However, now there are actually three equilibria, not one. Two equilibria are corner equilibria. And then there's the interior equilibrium. Moreover, the corner equilibria are actually stable equilibrium. The one in the middle is unstable, so we should really ignore it. Okay. So let's see why. So this corner, V bar equal to zero, is one possible equilibrium here in this picture. Why is that? Well, V bar equal to zero means what? It means that everybody acts pro-socially. Everybody donates blood. Okay, all the V types. Now, the way the picture appears, that's you know that's that's uh, a best response for everyone because even for the marginal type, you know the the. the when V bar equal to zero, the benefit is higher than the cost. So even the zero type is willing to act pro-socially given the position of the benefit curve that it starts above the cost line. If you swing to the other corner here, uh, this is an equilibrium where nobody acts pro-socially. And it is an equilibrium because even for type one, even for V equal to one, the most generous guys, the benefit curve is about below the cost line. And so even the most generous guys in this situation do not want to contribute. And therefore everybody below them do not want to contribute either. So everybody contributing and everybody being expected to contribute or act pro-socially can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And nobody, acting pro-socially is likewise could also be a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? Now, uh, this kind of multiplicity is easiest to see for pure gestures, right? So different societies have different, uh, different, polite gestures or gestures of greeting or respect. Uh, you know, in India, we do our namaste. In, in the West, they shake hands. They used to shake hands before the pandemic uh, and so on. Um, so different societies have, so that is a manifestation of multiplicity, yes. Uh, in India, this is what is expected, and this is what everybody does. Uh, in the West, this is not what is expected. Some other gesture is expected, and that is what everybody does. Uh, sometimes you have, uh, I did have a picture. Yeah. Sometimes we have mismatches when people across cultures meet. This is our former president. Pratibha Patil meeting the Turkish president at the time, Abdullah Kul, I think. And um, yeah, there's a coordination failure. Now, when it comes to pure gestures, right, whether we do this or whether we shake hands has no payoff relevance, ignore the pandemic situation, right? In themselves, these actions don't affect our payoffs. But if gestures of politeness, what makes you a good person in the eyes of others, if they, if they latch on not to pure gestures like this, but to acts of genuine acts of generosity and, and uh, you know, acts of helping others like donating blood and so on and so forth, then 
some societies can successfully create norms and expectations that this is how people have to behave and they can reap the benefits of that. Some other societies may fail in that coordination task, right? They may fail to generate a social normal convention that uh, donating blood or helping old people cross the street or helping out in, in, in teaching uh, underprivileged children in the weekends, uh, these are meaningful actions. They may fail to develop those uh, social norms. And, and there, which kind of equilibrium we gravitate to, whether it's this equilibrium where, where everyone acts pro-socially or whether it's the other equilibrium where no one does, that has a huge consequence for society. This is not just, you know, uh, going from the namaste equilibrium to the handshake equilibrium. This is going from uh, a, a bad equilibrium to a good equilibrium. Yes. Okay, so we see that multiplicity can indeed arise. Uh, so what I'll show you in the next lecture is the other effect that we were talking about, that sometimes if we increase the monetary payoffs, why the prices it may have, it may be counterproductive, it may reduce the set of people who act pro socially. So we are yet to see that, but I'll show you that. Okay, so I'll stop there for today and take any questions you may have. Um, so I had a doubt about the internal 